Welcome to those joining us now for our, our webinar today. We're going to get started in just a few moments. Uh, we're just letting a few more people get signed in. It's just going to be a few more moments while people get signed in. Welcome to all those who are joining us right now. Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. Um, and just before we get started on the webinar, just go over just a few things. You can uh, definitely change the, the way you're viewing it, whether it's our video or the slides, make them bigger or larger. Uh, there should also be audio controls for you to listen in. Uh, make sure that if you are using a headset that's plugged in or, or connected through Bluetooth uh, and turned on, um, and there should, there's also a Q&A box tool there to allow you to ask questions. We will have a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar, but if you have questions throughout the webinar, if something comes up, put it in then so you remember it. Uh, and like I said, we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. So today's webinar is navigating the property, property taxation through these challenging times. Today, we have three special guests from Alta's group. Phil Gertzman, who's the Executive Vice President and, uh, for BC and National Initiatives. Robert Bluen, the Senior Consultant. And Pedro Tavares, Senior Director and General Manager. No. We're pleased to have Robert, Phil, and, and Pedro from Alta's group to present this special webinar to our, to our members. Through this webinar, we'll hope that you have a better understanding of the assessment and property tax system in BC. So we can go ahead and bring on our three presenters. Welcome. Good afternoon. Okay, well, I think our, our we have most of our attendees here and it's on to you now. Okay, shall I begin? Um, uh, once again, my name is Pedro Tavares. Um, I'm uh, currently Senior Director GM with Altus Group with the Valuation Advisory Team here in Vancouver. Um, briefly, I've been um, with Altus since its inception in 2005, and, I, and I've been a, a long-term AACI for about 20 years, and um, very appreciative of the opportunity to connect with all of you today to discuss this important topic. I'm, uh, I'm Rob, I'm a senior consultant in the tax division. Um, I've been at Altus uh, since about 2006, 2007, uh, working along in our, in our tax team under Phil. Yeah, my name's Phil Gertzman. I've been at this uh, longer than I uh, care to admit, doing nothing but uh, property tax uh, assessment, reviews, appeals, uh, due diligence and whatnot for a wide range of uh, commercial and multifamily residential uh, clientele. Okay, um, I'm going to kick off the presentation. Uh, and just to begin, um, there's quite a bit of material in this slide deck. So um, we're going to try to be brief, uh, focus on some, some key themes and topics, um, and um, just be advised that we're gonna to try to make available a copy of the presentation. You can either contact us directly and or we'll give a copy to Landlord BC. Up in front of you is today's agenda. Um, I'll start off with uh, reviewing, in case you're not familiar with the Altus Group, who we are, um, cover off a couple of key market trends uh, in the multifamily space uh, before uh, passing it off to my tax colleagues 
uh, to kind of review some some key topics related to your to, to the property taxation space for BC here in 2021. Okay, uh, just in case you don't know who Altis is, um, you know we're uh, we're a global company. We're uh, a leading provider of software, data solutions, and technology-enabled expert services in the global commercial industry. Uh, I'm paid to say that, by the way. Next slide. <laughs> um, and like I said, we're globally based. And you know, as it relates to Canada and BC, uh, we've got just under 100 people here um, in the province. Uh, mainly in Vancouver, but we do have some boots in the ground um, in Kelowna. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as it relates to our expertise uh, that we offer um, in the province of BC, uh, again, today our focus of the presentation is talking about multifamily and in particular the property tax space. But, you know, out of our offices, we do do quite a bit of valuation appraisal work. Uh, we've got a cost and project management team providing uh, QS expertise, uh, loan monitoring support, and project management. And then uh, finally, uh, we've got a pretty good size group doing uh, uh, data research and providing solutions uh, to the market on that front. All right, so I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll move into sort of discussing some of the key market trends in the apartment sector for BC. And so, you know, I know that there, the, the topic of the COVID-19 pandemic has been exhaustively discussed. Um, and I, you know, I guess up in front of you are some, some, some key topics, but ultimately I would say that uh, obviously on the negative side, the government responses uh, to what's been happening around us has had an impact on the space. There was a motorarium that was uh, 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 you know, placed uh, into effect in 2020 now lifted and then We've got a rent freeze that's ultimately still ongoing and it's been extended to July 2021. Uh, but imp importantly, we would say that the effects on the multifamily space um, as it relates to COVID-19 have been definitely more limited. And this class performed much better than, than other asset classes in 2020 and going into 2021. Um, and, and, and ultimately, we would say that based on our you know, ongoing dialogue with our clientele, rent collection was definitely way better than what was expected. Uh, obviously it took a lot more time, but you know, we appreciate that many landlords are working definitely hard to, to, to do that as well as, you know, there were some strict protocols that, that came from the province related to, to COVID-19 with respect to cleaning and, and security on some fronts. Um, you, know, you know, generally expenses have been increasing. We've been noticing uh, um, obviously the insurance premiums uh, I'll let my colleagues talk about property taxes in a second, uh, but you know we could almost spend quite a bit of time talking about expenses. We know how important it is to to, to you know to, to every apartment owner, uh, given that you you only collect gross rents, right? So it, it it really impacts your bottom line, right? So lots of important management around expenses we notice going on today, and uh, lastly, and and um, you know I'll get to, into more detail with respect to some of the evidence we've seen on on rent softening. And, and, and we've seen generally vacancy rates start to creep up um, on a couple of fronts. Okay, so, you know, just moving on to like rents, um, you know, I just, we took a little bit of a national lens here um, and sourced a neat little report from rentals.ca. This data isn't perfect. We acknowledge that 100%, but, you know, I think it's a good snapshot for, um, from a national perspective for all property types, um, you know, not just including apartment, but townhouse, single family homes across the country that have been listed um, for rent. That, as you can see, um, throughout 2020, there was definitely an impact starting May, starting in May to the end of the year where, where rents started to show some decline. You know, focusing on key markets in the province of BC, Highlighted in front of you are some year-over-year -year changes, again, from rentals.ca. Um, um, and ultimately, we, we've, we've shown, you know, where some of the biggest declines were. Um, obviously, the one-bedroom segment in Vancouver and Victoria, um, you know, contrasted by, um, you know, some, some, some pretty good growth in, in the Surrey market. 
I, I did take uh, an opportunity to speak to a couple of colleagues in, you know, working out of Kelowna and the Okanagan region and not included up there is uh, obviously the city of Kelowna, which I was quoted very roughly uh, reflected pretty good growth, like anywhere from under 10% to as high as over 20%. And, uh, you know, largely attributed to um, quite a bit of new supply being added in that market and the continuation of strong fundamentals with low vacancy and good demand. Um, you know, and, and just moving back to Vancouver and Victoria, I think, you know, we look at those numbers with a bit of a grain of salt because ultimately, you know, there's, there's pretty big markets. I would say the downtown segment for Vancouver probably showed a more decline than would Victoria. And, and you know, at the same time, um, you know, student housing districts with rental supply, um, you know, we've seen more declines there because of the need of not requiring students to, to, to be in class, right? So, um, you know, coupled with the fact that, you know, immigration or in particular international students coming into our province have definitely taken a bit of a hiatus or a pause given everything that's happening um, at our borders. And so um, I guess, um, you know, it remains to be seen we're in the midst of a, of a period where there's a rent freeze uh, we hope that that gets lifted um, and we are concerned about, you know, any kind of new policies that, that could impact the space going forward. Okay, just switching over to a view of where maximal, maximum allowable increases have been in BC. Um, you know, historically, you know, there was a couple of ups and downs, but generally much higher levels and more recently and since the election of our NDP government. And um, you know, with there there being a, a, a decline uh, since 2019, what you see for 2020 is really just uh, taking the the announced September 2020 figure of 1.4 and cutting it in half. And like I said, we're concerned about what's going to happen in July 1st, and uh, you know, uh, whether or not it's going to be extended once again. We're hoping not. Okay, we were asked to briefly profile. Um, the purpose-built apartment segment as part of our presentation. And so uh, that theme will contain, continue on um, the next couple of slides. But, you know, uh, you know, starting off, just taking a look at where completions have been in the Vancouver, greater Vancouver area. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely been much better um, from 2015 onward with roughly 29,000 units uh, being um, added to the market. And you know that's an average of around 4,800 per year, and, and showing a nice increasing trend before 2020. By the way, these statistics are from CMHC's 2020 report. I know their 2020 report is going to come out in the next couple of days, so we're we're eager to see uh, where some of the current statistics will lie. Uh, moving on to like another important indicator that we like to to, to review is. Um, you know, we're, you know, as it relates to kind of expectation for supply is, you know, what, uh, what are the number of issued development permits? And so here we focused on the city of Vancouver. Um, as, as you can see, since the middle of 2016, um, you know, and that's likely to be a, a, a longer historical trend where strata condo projects have largely outpaced purpose-built rental or PBR projects. Um, do find it interesting that as of 2020 in the city of Vancouver, we had more units approved for purpose built rental uh, versus strato condo. Um, is that going to continue? There was other kind of headwinds impacting the strata condo space um, that predated uh, the, the pandemic, uh, largely attributed to, to you know some some government policy that that just made it difficult to uh, to build strata condo. So uh, something important for us to kind of look. Uh, and monitor in 2021. And again, um, you know, looking forward uh, as it relates to not looking forward, but looking backwards, um, and 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 reviewing the the volume of of of, of sales in the BC Lower Mainland. Um, you know, the purpose built rental segment has been growing. In 2016, it was 11% of $1.3 billion of sales. And fast forward to last year, it's grown to 27% um, of nearly $1.4 billion in sales. So I think that's, you know, we think generally that's obviously growing 
a growing appetite, more uh, buyers, be it local or from outside our province, looking in at those opportunities here. Uh, we do think that also, you know, reflects uh, resiliency and, and, and preference for, for investors looking at apartment opportunities to purchase a brand new uh, building. Okay, uh, switching on the next couple of slides to um, an outlook on valuation parameters, particularly cap rates. In case you're not aware, Altus engages in a quarterly national survey where we target anywhere from say 100 and uh, 125 to 150 active market participants, buyers, lenders, owners, brokers, and so forth. And we focus on collecting opinion related to uh, major asset classes with respect to, you know, obviously valuation parameters, buy, sell preferences, uh, outlook on debt and so forth. So up in front of you are very recent hot off the press results uh, from Q4 2020 for the suburban Vancouver area. Um, and, you know, the, the benchmark definition is focused on a larger high rise and older product. And so, as you can sort of see Vancouver, and this has been a continual theme, um, you know, looking back last five, 10 years, we continue to lead the market in terms of where cap rates uh, uh, sentiment is. And so the opinion there was around three to 4% averaging three and a half. Um, and then historically over 2020, you can see that the cap rates there to the top right um, were generally relatively static and stable. And so, you know, it's going to be really important uh, to kind of monitor, um, you know, the current environment. I think for the start of 2021, we generally have seen a pretty big uptick in, in availability of listings in the marketplace. And so expecting, you know, the supply, the supply of, of new listings to kind of you know, be, be uh, you know, in, in a similar vein. Um, there's lots of support from obviously a low cost of debt environment and uh, very, very active demand landscape where there's lots of investors from outside BC, both here in Canada and outside Canada, uh, looking at looking for opportunities um, to purchase. Uh, scale does matter. Um, and, you know, if we look at the next couple of slides, um, we just focus on some notable apartment transactions over 25 million uh, that occurred here in Metro Vancouver, um, as well as some other key areas. But you know, again, uh, as you can see the common theme here, um, three of the four sales in front of you were purpose-built rentals. Um, and, you know, there's generally pretty strong pricing on them. Um, low cap rates, maybe with the exception of number four. So one, three, and four were purpose-built rentals. Aqua 88 um, is a, a new apartment project in New West. It actually closed in 2020, but it's a deal that was negotiated a couple, one or two years ago. Uh, with the buyer, buyer being Starlight and Blackstone in the background, taking on the leasing risk. So a bit of a, a different profile in terms of the value and, and relative uh, valuation parameters. Uh, lastly here, um, here's a couple of uh, key benchmark sales, larger sales for the Okanagan and Victoria markets. Um, once again, three or four were purpose built rentals. That's one, two, and three. Um, and um, you know, showing uh, relatively healthy cap rates for these markets, you know, four and a quarter to just low fives uh, for the Vernon location. And uh, what we have found interesting for these two these two markets have been, um, you know, the, on the buyer front leading the charge is uh, these are Canadian REITs um, that that uh, made these acquisitions. They're all based out of BC, and uh, you know show a, a, a pretty good representation of, of how attractive the BC market is um, when considering apartment uh, sale opportunities here. So on that note, I'm going to uh, 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 transition, we're gonna transition back to my tax colleagues uh, to review um, you know, some important topic, topics around property taxation here going forward. Thanks, Pedro. Um... So yeah, this uh, we're going to start on the the an, an important topic here, um, a timely relevant topic as we're moving very close to an appeal deadline. Um, but uh, to, to begin, we just wanted to run through the uh, assessment cycle uh, in BC. So we we do have an annual role um, here in in British Columbia. Uh, the valuation date 
uh, every year is July 1st. Uh, so when you get your valuations uh, in January, they're already about six months out of date, but um, the, the key valuation date in terms of sales, uh, rents, market, uh, market uh, indicators is July 1. Um, the October 31st deadline is the physical condition and use date. So this impacts a property um, if it's being built or potentially decommissioned. Um, you're looking at whatever is on that site uh, as of October 31st of that year. Um, appeals, everyone gets their notices in, in early January. Um, it was January 4th this year that we were back to work. So we are a few days behind when we uh, got out of the gate, but we've got a very short timeline in actually make appeal decisions. So once you put that a short turnaround, it is actually very first uh, one day. Um, the next piece of, of it all are the, uh, the tax rates. Uh, or sorry, actually, uh, let's talk about the first level of appeal. So once we file our appeals, um, the first level, the part hearings uh, start, and they run uh, generally through the end of February to mid-March. Um, so we've got also a very short deadline of, of actually trying to get things done at the first level, as we call it, um, the, the PARP time. Um, whether you're successful or not, uh, everything wraps up, like I say, towards the end of March. Um, and then you've got about a month and a half till the end of April to decide if you're happy with your result. If you're not, you can uh, take it forward to the second level of appeal, which is the Property Assessment Appeal Board, and you have to file those decisions uh, by the end of April. Um, Tax rates, uh, a very important part of the assessment piece or the property tax piece, they come out in May, generally set by the municipalities. Then we start to receive our tax bills in May uh, as well. And then uh, property tax payments start becoming due. Just a quick look at, um, you know, over the past 10 years, where have apartment values, where have tax trends gone uh, over, over the last decade? Um, these sort of uh, pick the property in the lower mainland, but it's very representative of uh, a, a lot of different areas. Um, what we've seen over the past 10 years are, are values creep up and, and this is uh, being looked at on a, on a value per room basis. Um, but, you know, we, in, in the lower mainland, especially rolling up into the 2017, 2018, were sort of uh, really big years, 2019 as well, um, 2019 reflecting 2018 sales activity. Um, we did see the market starting to slow down in 2019, uh, especially in the lower mainland. I think it, it um, heated up in other areas like Victoria, uh, the island, uh, the Okanagan, those sorts of areas. So. Um, so they, they lagged a little bit behind and, and would uh, start to see their peak sort of coming up in 2020 as the lower mainland started to go down. Um, the property taxes as well, which uh, is an important piece, uh, they have doubled over that, that time frame as well. So starting from 2010 to 2020, despite uh, mill rates uh, going down and, and mill rates are going down as a result of values going up over that time period, but property taxes overall have uh, become a bigger and bigger expense item in, uh, in everyone's income and expense statements. Um, so it's, it's a, a very, something that we, we need to really actively manage and, and do what we can to help reduce. So the system in BC, it's called an, an ad valorem system. And what that means is that properties are valued and then they're classified according to their use. So we have all kinds of different use classifications, um, multifamily all fall into the residential classification, which generally has a bit more of a forgiving uh, mill rate compared to industrial and commercial, uh, that, those sorts of properties. Um, but the, the property assessment itself is the only piece of this that can actually get challenged. So when we uh, want an assessment, when a municipality sets their 
their mill rates, which is the second piece of the property tax bill, um, mill rates aren't something that we can challenge. So uh, the, the focus is always just on the actual property assessment and, and how BC assessment has come to that value. Uh, so how are multifamily assets uh, assessed here in the province? Um, well, the vast majority um, are assessed on the income approach, and that's, of course, assuming that the highest and best use is still to be uh, a, a, an apartment building. Um, we have seen more and more in, in lots of municipalities now, uh, especially in the lower mainland, even on the island. Uh, but properties whose land values have actually gotten so big uh, that the income approach to value is not the highest and best use for the property anymore. And uh, we'll get into that uh, in, in a little later in our presentation. But I just wanted to, to show a basic uh, valuation. This is uh, a, a property valuation sheet that you can, or summary that you can request from BC Assessment um, that gives the details of your property and, and how the value was, was come to. Um, so they're generally based on area specific rents um, vacancy and expense ratios. Um, and then they are adjusted for things like building quality, um, that sort of thing. Um, the methodology is consistent across property types. So, um, you know, even the, the very small properties to the very, very large properties are all looked at on, uh, on the income approach uh, like this is. So it's the starting with the rents to gross incomes, coming up with a net operating income and then applying a, a market cap rate to that to come up with the value. And now I'm gonna pass things over to Phil uh, to chat a bit more. Thanks for that, Rob. And I think Rob and Pedro have done most of the heavy lifting here. You know, Rob, do you have the ability to go back a slide? Cause I think it's, I think that previous slide is actually more helpful for what I was gonna chat about. Um, when Pedro is asked to do an appraisal, sometimes he's asked to do a fee simple appraisal, but sometimes they're asked to reflect what a property would sell for kind of encumbered with leases in place. And obviously the longer term leases that are in place will um, provide a greater impact on, on value than if it, uh, everything's uh, short term and can go to market. But one of the comments I often get from clients is I'm only getting, you know, in this example, it says $1,500 the assessor's using for 25 one bedroom units. They say, I'm only getting $1,300 per unit. Um, how, how can they assess me at $1,500 per unit? And unfortunately, the way the legislation is, is structured is the assessor has to basically strip away any of your existing lease arrangements that are encumbering the property. And in the case of residential apartment buildings, often current rents um, up until perhaps quite recently um, uh, were lagging, lagging market rents because you couldn't increase your, your, your rents uh, by the extent that rents were actually were escalating or getting them up to market. So the assessor is entitled to assess your market, uh, sorry, your property at uh, full market rents as of July 1st, whatever that uh, valuation might, date might be. Um, so uh, not exactly fair in that regard. Um, the other element, and you can skip ahead now, Rob, to the next uh, slide. Another one that gets uh, challenging is um, the highest and best use. So all property in the province is assessed, um, virtually all, uh, is based on highest and best use. In other words, what could you, uh, what's the highest and best use you could put that property uh, to? And in the case of a, a market, especially in greater Vancouver market, where we've seen land values escalating uh, significantly, pulling back more, more recently, but over time, a really significant escalation in land values, the existing uses aren't necessarily the highest and best use. So you might have an apartment building generating income, uh, you know, rented out to full and rented out to tenants as a going concern, but BC assessment was, was uh, based on the legislation, they have to come along and they have to go, you know what, this property might be worth 5 million based on capitalizing its income streams, but the land alone as a vacant is worth $10 million. And so they, that uh, becomes a challenge obviously um, because the taxes will get become, get out of whack with respect to the income streams that that uh, property is, is generating. And, and as developers certainly know that uh, apartment buildings can be quite a barrier to take advantage of that highest and best use, whether it be having to compensate tenants significantly, um, 
allowing tenants rights of first refusal, coming back into developments, unit replacement policies, providing subsidized housing, all sorts of uh, barriers to developing a property that has an apartment building on it in many of the municipalities um, versus uh, a site that might have a commercial use or a vacant site might be much easier to, to develop. Uh, there's a bullet point on the right there. It says property specific issues. Um, anything that is specific to your property is important to highlight with the assessor. Um, whether you're suffering uh, you know, above market uh, vacancies for something related specific to your property that's not market in general, um, maybe a significant capital spend is required for uh, deferred maintenance or, or repairs that are outstanding. Uh, the assessor is required to assess, they, they assess property on a mass appraisal basis, but they are uh, required to uh, acknowledge and reflect in your valuation any uh, specific characteristics or any issues you may be facing with your specific property. One thing that tends to happen, and uh, for anyone who's appealed their assessment, they may, they may know this, um, BC Assessment will provide a calculation as Rob showed us a couple of slides back in terms of how they assess their property. And usually it is on an income approach. So assumptions around rents and vacancy expense, cap rate, uh, unit uh, counts, all that sort of thing. Um, that's not often how they defend the assessment. So. We might submit some information, make a submission to BC Assessment saying, listen, the, the market rent or the rents being achieved in this property are $1,500 for the one bedrooms. You're using 1,800, it's over assessed. Um, and uh, that can have merit, that type of approach, but more and more what BC Assessment's doing is they're going, yeah, that may be true, but we're right overall. And the evidence that we're right overall is that you know here's some comparable apartment building sales and they're selling for 400,000 a door and uh, uh, that 400,000 door supports what we have on your assessment. So yes, we're using higher rents, but that must mean we're, we have an error somewhere else, either the cap rate or the expenses, um, that sort of thing. So if you are talking to BC Assessment, uh, it's important to have all market sales that have happened and uh, have analyzed them to at least some extent so you can know if what they uh, come back to you with uh, has merit or not. Um, it's very important to, when it comes to assessments on multifamily to deal with apples with apples. Um, you know, uh, multifamily is similar and with other multifamily, but only to the extent that the suite mix might be similar. The age, obviously location is, is a big uh, issue. The um, uh, square footage, uh, you know, the suite mix, all that sort of thing. So um, it's dangerous to kind of oversimplify things. So it's important to get down a little more micro in terms of the characteristics of your specific property if you are comparing it to a another one that is, is sold um, or, or um, perhaps an equity comparison where you're looking looking at a, other apartment buildings and saying their assessments are lower than yours um, are they are they are you, are you measuring that appropriately using the various uh, units of comparison Rob, uh, okay, I think I'll take these, uh, this slide as well. Uh, no presentation would be complete without just spending uh, just a minute or two. Uh, how's our time? I think we're doing okay. Uh, just the uh, variety of other taxes that uh, have, have come down the pipe in recent years. Um, fortunately, they don't impact multifamily to the same extent as they do some other um, property types, but uh, uh, they can, and so I'll just quickly touch on them. Uh, the speculation and vacancy tax, this is a, a provincial tax um, brought in by the provincial government primarily to mirror, mirrors the empty home tax in Vancouver, which I'll touch on in a minute, um, primarily targeting um, uh, vacancy of uh, single family condos, that type of property. Um, but starting this year, it actually also applies to, um, uh, to uh, vacant land. So. Uh, it always applied to vacant land, but they had exempted it, and that exemption has not been renewed for this year. Uh, it only applies to residentially classified vacant land. Um, so if you have residentially classified vacant land, um, then this tax will kick in. And it, uh, it this is the spec tax applies in the lower mainland, parts of the Okanagan, and parts of uh, parts of the the island, and primarily it's at 0.5% is the Canadian citizen uh, rate. You can see on the slide there. Moving through this quickly, the property transfer tax. Um, property transfer tax does impact uh, a multifamily property to the extent that there's a bit of a bonus, an extra 2% uh, 
transfer tax that kicks in over uh, uh, greater than $2 million. Uh, I think it's greater than $3 million, I thought. What do we have here? Yeah, I think the extra 2% kicks on kicks in after 3 million and up, it becomes 5%. So instead of it, it's 2%, then it goes to 3% and then to 5%. And so um, if your property is classified uh, residential, then that higher rate uh, will apply on the amounts over 3 million. And, um, you know, I've, I've had clients exploring, are there ways to um, you know, change the classification of your property if it's gonna undergo a transfer? Um, because uh, in particular, uh, you know, on vacant land that can be done more readily than uh, apartments, but there are ways to do it in apartments as well. Next slide, foreign buyers tax uh, brought in by the liberals at a rate of 15% and then uh, raised up to 20% uh, by the NDP. Um, obviously a, a big disincentive for uh, foreign buyers to acquire uh, residentially classified properties. And more and more, the property assessment is becoming more relevant for taxation policy, much more than your property tax bill. Here we see that the classification element, you know, being uh, uh, very relevant for whether it be the spec tax, the empty homes tax they'll be talking about, additional school tax they'll be talking about, and the foreign buyers tax. So that classification dictating which of these other taxes it may apply to. And again, uh, if a property uh, can get reclassified it, uh, when you're putting it up for sale or acquiring it, um, the amount of foreign buyers tax would absolutely plummet. Um, so if you're trying to attract a foreign buyer. City of Vancouver empty homes tax. Uh, I thought they were crazy when they brought this in, but what do I know? Because um, it seems to have, uh, have had good staying power so much so and been so popular that they raised it from 1% to 3%. Um, uh, very recently. So it doesn't apply to properties that have more than four units, but it, uh, um, unlike, I should have mentioned the spec tax, uh, there are a number of pretty broad exemptions if for, for development activity that can get you out of the spec tax. The empty homes tax is much more restrictive. I could do a whole presentation on these taxes. So if you want anything more, uh, shoot me an email or give me a call or whatnot. But um, empty homes tax is much tougher to get out of um, and um, very punitive. So I was talking to a developer yesterday and you know, the market slowed down and uh, they couldn't sell their all their units and they've been sitting on them for some time. And now they're this year, they're actually having to pay empty homes tax on unsold inventory, um, which is really salt in the wound, right? Because you already got the carrying costs of your uh, product you're trying to sell. And then you get to give away 3% of the value on top of that. So uh, becoming a real big issue um, impacting at least the development side of the business. Uh, fortunately, um, again, being more than four units, most multifamily projects, uh, the empty homes tax or spec tax is not a factor. Um, additional school tax, uh, again, uh, this doesn't apply to uh, multifamily, so dodge another bullet on this one, uh, targeting primarily the attached homes, condos, townhouse units, and a, and residentially classified vacant land. So again, that classification on the assessment notice become a, a big deal and can uh, uh, dramatically increase taxes, the AST as we refer to it as, because um, uh, these rates of 0.2% and 0.4%, certainly the 0.4% is higher than most residential tax rates in the province to start with. And this one does apply uh, province wide. You can't uh, escape this one based on where you're uh, properties located. So I realized that was kind of very high level and quick and dirty, but just wanted to touch on those taxes. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, so we just wanted to, to also discuss uh, what resources might exist for you uh, as a property owner to help review and, and potentially appeal uh, your assessment. And there are a lot of good resources out there. Um, now obviously, uh, I, I hope everyone's familiar with the, the BC assessment website. It, it has an assessment search function uh, feature that uh, allows you to look up information on your property um, and also similar properties uh, around you so you can see how they've been treated. Have they gone up? Have they gone down? Um, you know, this is a, a key part of a, an equity sort of uh, review that you need to do uh, just to, to make sure that you're being treated fairly and like other properties um, similar to yours in your specific areas. Um, it also, uh, you know, it has a great map function. It has 
it, it has a sales tab that you can click on so you can see it, it that that might need a little bit of work it'll just spit out a bunch of sales that are nearby you and not necessarily specific uh the, to to your property that you've searched but um it, it, it will sort of highlight some of the sales in that area as well um and, and it does give information such as uh when the property was built uh, number of suites it has that sort of thing so it is a very helpful uh resource to use um i also would would highly recommend and i'm sure most of you already do uh, but signing up for broker reports to receive information on listings and sales because this can really help to fill in some of the blanks uh, that you don't have and that you can't get from from a website such as bc assessments um, you know when it comes to unit type unit mix um, you know how is the property renovated is it uh, is it still sort of uh, needing renovations and there's a lot of upside? Um, you know, getting those broker reports uh, can help you make sense of the sales once they do uh, once they do transact. Uh, so you can look at that price and and start to compare it to your property on a on a dollar per room basis, um, and and see how it uh, see what sort of information the market is telling you about the value of your property. Um, Another important piece is, is obviously to, to discuss, uh, give BC assessment a call um, to talk about your assessment, request the property valuation summary that they've used, um, that we, we alluded to and, and uh, showed. Uh, there's, there's one of these for every property that is valued on the income approach. So getting that so you can actually review your inputs, um, you know, again, the, the rents that they're going to have in the PVS are going to be market rents. And, and this is another thing that we do focus on. And, and when we do get information from our clients, um, you know, we always request a few things on the rent rolls. And, and um, some of the key things that we need to see are you know, obviously unit types, unit areas, uh, but also the start dates. And, and so it's really important to see you know, for example, in 2020, what are the new leases? Um, you know, what the, the, the properties, uh, the suites that have turned over, what rents were they able to command uh, after turnover? Because um, that is, is something we focus on um, it, when we compare that to the valuation summary that's provided by BC Assessment. And uh, of course, just to give ourselves a plug, but uh, contacting professionals like the Altus Group, we'd be very happy to assist you in, in reviewing and, and even appealing if you've got an appeal that you're working on that you, uh, you're frustrated with and, and not getting anywhere. Um, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to help you out and, and uh, review that, discuss that with you. So um, always, again, you know, helping people review and, and appeal their assessments is what we're here for. Um, a few closing remarks as we uh, before we transition to uh, to our Q and A period. But um, you know, again, uh, just wanted to highlight: staying informed is is really important. Um, keeping track of, of market sales, keeping track of all that market information, uh, but also you know, municipal decisions. Um, last year it was uh, we actually were able to delay our, our second property tax payments, um, you know, listening, finding out when those deadlines are, making sure you're, you're paying your property taxes before you incur any late penalties, um, you know, very, very important to stay informed. Um, and also wanted to highlight that, uh, you know, the, the system is here for a reason. So uh, again, um, discussing your property with BC assessment, requesting your assessment, reviewing it uh, on your own, making sure that that it makes sense. And, and um, you know, if you are questioning it, uh, considering a professional opinion as well. Uh, but again, the system system's here and, and uh, firms like ours are, are here just to, uh, to help people out with, with property taxes, which have become such a, a uh, an increasing line item in the expenses, uh, bringing down sort of what what people are able to put in their pockets. And uh, I was just going to actually now pass this back over to Hunter uh, to close out these last two remarks. Thank you. Uh, yes. So, of course, um, on this front, advocacy is always important. Uh, and through Landlord BC, through our, our robust advocacy efforts, we are continuing to, to work on this topic itself uh, at, with all levels of government, including provincial and, of course, municipal. You need to 
uh, as mentioned at the beginning, staying informed means staying connected as well. Uh, that means attending things like our webinar today, making sure that uh, you're, you're reading our regular e-news. If you're not a member of Landlord BC, you can sign up for a non-members e-news uh, as well through our website, uh, which also has information, of course, about membership opportunities. That website is just www.landlordbc.ca. We can go on to the perfect. So th thank you, uh, all three of you. That was very, very great information, very timely information. Um, and uh, we're now going to move into a uh, Q&A session. Um, so we've had a few questions come in to our attendees. Uh, please go ahead and use that Q&A tool uh, in the uh, webinar toolbox there to ask your questions of our three expert uh, presenters today. Um, so, you know, the I guess the 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 first question that had come in um, is is how do we understand uh, the relationship relationships between the overall cap rate, um, the internal rate of return, uh, and terminal cap rate, and, and which one really kind of helps determine a project valuation. Okay, I'd be happy to kind of, uh, or unless you want to, Phil, I mean, I, I, oh, I, I, I was thinking you all the way on this one, Peter. Uh, um, okay, well, it's a good question. Um, look, at the end of the day for the apartment space, what drives a lot of valuation, be it it's for acquisition, sale, or even assessment, um, cap rates are paramount, like there's a paramount importance. Um, and an income approach to value is, is still the driving, in, in our view, uh, uh, um, methodology to rationalize a value. Having said that, what we're finding in our, our experience over the last couple of years, over a while, is that the more sophisticated buyer, owner, particularly for larger scale properties, um, you know, uh, have a lot of public reporting requirements, are starting to use discounted cash flow valuation methodology, which in turn would reflect internal rates of return, terminal cap rates and, and so forth, right? So, um, you know, I would say for the apartment product, you know, compared to like valuing say a big retail project or office building, we got a lot of foreseeable contractual income that you can look at. The apartment space, you know, you got either year leases or month to month. Projecting five or ten years out isn't perfect, uh, but you know, nonetheless, you know, some of these buyers are doing it, and really, it's you know, the, the internal rate, you know, I mean, the internal rate really is a reflection of expectation of return over time, and some of the increases that you may be able to, to obtain, um, you know, and and balancing that, and the issues with rental is that. You know, you, you have a fixed rate or, or a gross rent structure versus fixed expenses. And so uh, we've seen it's a lot of fluctuations that can impact those uh, returns uh, when you kind of compare project by project. Terminal cap is just sort of like if you hold it for 10 years and you sell it at the end or five, that's what you expect the cap rate to be. So um, I hope that I'd be happy to talk to you on the phone if someone has some more questions about that. Uh, by the way, Hunter, I took a look at the other question. I might as well just tackle it. Somebody had a question about what purpose boat rental is. So that's sort of a brand new apartment project. Um, you know, that's, you know, focused on, on a, a rental use versus, you know, condo or selling for condo strata. And if, if you would allow me, I actually had, you know, I came into this with some key questions from my colleagues, because I, I think they're useful for the audience to hear because they're sort of right in the thick of things going through assessment. Uh, reviews, you know, in advance of a, a deadline that's going to be end of January. So I, I'm, I'm interested to hear, you know, what has been your experience in general, uh, uh, Rob and Phil, with respect to how assessments for multifamily product or, or property, you know, what, what are they like and how are they compared to like, say, 2020 for the 2021 assessment? Well, I'd love to answer that. My cell phone went off just as I was trying to hear it. So. <laughs> Teach me not to uh, uh, turn it off, Rob. You want to take a run of that one? Yeah, sure. I think um, in in a lot of areas, um, 
I think assessments are flat um, from what we've seen. Um, you know, some areas have gone down. Um, you know, generally, I haven't seen decreases of, of much more than seven or eight percent. I would say that's been sort of the, the larger increase, um, and again, largely dependent on the areas. Um, I think BC assessment, uh, especially. Uh, was a little gun shy because there wasn't a lot of market activity, um, you know, especially over the summer months when we usually see a lot of transactions coming in. Um, it was crickets. So, you know, we, we, we started the year with some transactions that um, that sort of were more of the same of what we had seen, not as strong as what they had been, but um, but healthy transactions um, for a long time. Uh, there were no sales and, and sales started to trickle in late in the year um, for for stuff that for, for numbers that that kind of surprised me even a little bit. But um, but I think because of the lack of that information, um, the, the negativity, you know, that the talk about um, rental deferment, uh, you know, rents certainly weren't going up. We were in a rental freeze. Um, so, you know, because of all that, I think they were very, very hesitant to to uh, increase values. So, so typically we've seen either values roll over or um, go down slightly. There's a, a few questions that have, have come in. So maybe in the interest of time, I'll just spend two minutes uh, touching on some of them uh, so that folks go away with some answers. One of them, uh, I get this a few times, does BC assessment have access to income tax uh, records and whatnot? Um, uh, no, uh, they do not have access to that. Uh, information, those levels of government don't share that information with BC assessment. Um, uh, some questions that relate to building values going up on assessments. And um, what's important to remember with your assessment notice when you get it is uh, what matters typically is the total value. The way BC assessment looks at it is they might do an income approach, come up with a total value of say $5 million. And then they look at the value of the land as a vacant, which might be say 2 million, and then the, the building value is just a residual. So whether the building value goes up or down is just a function of how BC assessment's allocating value. It doesn't really have, um, generally doesn't have much impact on your uh, overall uh, taxes. Um, what else do we have in here? It uh, talks about, sorry, go ahead. There's a question about, I guess, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on cap rates. Um, you know, I think the theme of our presentation in general is that this space, the multifamily space performed pretty well, um, in general last year, um, compared to other asset classes. So the impact was more muted on cap rates. Um, I would say just thinking of the audience here and whether or not if you own multifamily property with retail attached, um, at grade or, or not, right? Like that's probably areas where. Um, you know, in our experience, there's been impacts on rents, right? And be it that your tenants operating or not, it's probably an area to kind of focus in on, particularly when you look at your assessment, whether or not uh, the assessor got it right, because yeah, for sure, those are easily to identify the, the, the impact from COVID there. There's a comment in here that I uh, talks about COVID and rising taxes and whatnot. And I think maybe my, just one of my ending points would be, uh, uh, BC government uh, stood up and did something that no other province in Canada did. They reduced school taxes for most commercial property by 70%, um, which seemed like a really generous thing to do, cost the taxpayers about a billion dollars. But um, the reality is, is not all commercial property was suffering. Industrial assets and um, perform, have performed very well. So it was really as a result of COVID luck partially. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the pain, certainly certain asset types, retail, hospitality, entertainment really did suffer, but that money was sprinkled over such a broad range, including, you know, uh, you know office buildings, which had secure leases with, with larger companies in place. Um, the residential sector, the multifamily sector really didn't get uh, anything other than taxes, uh, um, sorry, rents, rents frozen. And so it almost got the, the negative side of it. So I think there is an advocacy role there. Um, obviously, everyone wants to manage manage taxes, but um, I think the, the government was generous with the amount of money, just not necessarily how they sprinkled it. Bit of personal opinion, not necessarily shared by <laughs> all this group or landlord PC, but my my belief, anyways. 
Can, can I offer a comment? Just as long as long as we're talking about like, you know, I guess government, various historical government policies and what may happen going forward. And, and I mean, I, I uh, sincerely support the advocacy that Landlord BC does for its membership. I think um, one of the things sort of on our radar, be it at Altus, uh, I forgot to mention that I, I sit on the board of directors for NAOP Vancouver. So what's sort of like, you know, when we connect with Landlord BC, other some of the other uh, partner organizations in the business, you know, climate change policy, right? This is something that's like, seems to be growing week to week, right? So be it that it's coming from the federal government to the provincial and, and local municipalities, I do think there needs to be, you know, a, an awakening among owners and active people in the market about how buildings operate and how they contribute to the overall sort of like carbon footprint. And, and I say that in a way res respectfully that uh, ultimately, um, you know, as owners, it should be, and uh, there should be a push to, to look for support because buildings, um, you know, they're expensive to run, to maintain. And, you know, you know, if you go going forward, there's this push for, 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 for doing energy retrofits and so forth, the government needs to support that in some way, shape or form, right? So, um, you know, I just think I've, I've been talking that about this, this issue uh, with lots of clients and others in the market. And I, I think we all have to kind of get together and continue to pressure our local uh, politicians to, to, to recognize uh, that, you know, in order to, to implement these policies, uh, owners are gonna need support. So I just thought I'd say that. Certainly. Well, thank you all three of you. And, and on that topic, I mean, uh, you know, throughout this year, there have been some increases in, in uh, the energy retrofit programs available uh, across the province. Uh, one of our, our partners, Fresco, uh, has pre presented a webinar along with uh, Wise Meter Solutions uh, just a, a couple months ago on this topic. So oh, um, I think that we got through quite a few of those questions. <laughs> Is there one time time for one more question? It's yeah. a burning question. I think yeah. everyone would like to hear this. Uh, Phil and, and, and Rob, what's going to happen to the mill rates in May of this year? How are the cities going to deal with the ones that had problems like, you know, accounting for their bills and spending and so forth? What are they going to do to us? What's going to yeah. happen? There's a loaded question, right? <laughs> a little softball served up softball. there. Well, I mean, uh, mill rates are a function of two things. Primarily, what happens to the tax base? And a lot of the tax base has been shrinking on the uh, commercial side. So the days of 10, 20% increases in assessments are over and we're seeing a lot of kind of reductions on the commercial side, flat, relatively flat on the residential side, we expect with the exception primarily of single family, which has gone up. Um, so there will be, uh, and then of course the other half of the coin is um, spending. And uh, I'm not sure when the last time I saw a municipal government spend at the rate of inflation. So. Um, City of Vancouver, I think, announced a 5% increase that they want. So, so if you've got average assessments staying relatively flat and, uh, you know, Ms. Pally wants 5% more money, then it's pretty simple math, right? Those mill rates are going to be going up. And Rob had a slide which showed a lot of mill rate reductions over the last decade. Uh, we've turned that corner and now mill rates, tax rates are going up. So it'll be a little bit uglier than what we're used to in terms of seeing taxes go up this year. Okay. Well, again, thank you to all, all three of you uh, and to, to Altus Group in general for this, this like I said, timely uh, presentation. Uh, to everyone attending today, uh, again, thank you for your, your questions and, and your attention on, again on this very, very important topic. Uh, stay tuned for information about our next webinar, uh, which is actually happening just next week, uh, presented by uh, CMHC. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, Hunter. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.